Hi everyone, thanks for joining our webinar. Sorry about the problems we had with the link, um, but glad that you're all uh, managing to get in now. We're going to be starting in a few moments, but in the meantime, if you could just take a moment to say hello in the chat by putting your name and where you're joining us from, and remember to select all the panelists and attendees from the two drop down menu. Thanks very much and we'll see you in a minute. Okay, welcome everyone to um, our event Menopause at Work Challenging Conversations. Hopefully you've all managed to uh, to get in and I know that people will uh, gradually be joining us as we um, as we go along. So thanks everyone for uh, joining us today. If we could just bring down the slide, that'd be fantastic, clear. And I'll ask all our panelists to put on their, their cameras. Thank you. Um, okay, so, um, I know we're all kind of living our lives through Zoom at the moment, but um, it's fantastic to see you all here and fantastic to join our panel panelists as well. And um, before we start, a number of you have asked if you can distribute the warm up videos for this event. So as you know, we had three speakers talking about uh, menopause at work. The answer is yes, please feel to use those videos as you wish. And the links will be put in the chat uh, in a moment. Um, now, as you know, the theme of this year's International Women's Day is challenging conversations. And I think when it comes to menopause, this not only speaks to the ongoing challenges women have in allowing their menopause to be legitimately recognised in work but also for the need for any conversations about menopause in the workplace to challenge the idea that this is uh, uh, an appropriate and not problematic and a relevant issue for managers and organisations to consider and support. Um, now, when I first started researching menopause, which was back in 2013, um, I remember one of the feedback forms that I got from one of the many rejections for funding um, for this said, um, what is the generalizability research? Is there a male equivalent? And what can we compare it to. And really the insinuation was that there's not a value in and of itself to explore this experience that half the working population will have at some point. Um, but luckily I think this view is certainly diminishing now and there's real momentum for exploring how workplaces can support menopausal transition and how listening to women's experiences is really key to this. Um, now there's absolutely fantastic research going on surrounding menopause. So Jo Bruce and her team at Leicester have looked at the, um, the costs of menopause saying that it costs around £28,000 to replace a woman in her late 40s and 50s who leaves the workplace, whilst Amanda Griffiths and her team at Nottingham and Kings have shown that all open cultures can have an impact on women's experiences of work. Um, and if this isn't compelling enough, we know that recent court cases have demonstrated that symptoms of menopause um, are legally protected under the Equalities Act, with the most recent tribunal stating that um, the claimant who um, the, the case was involved in is disabled by reason of menopause or symptoms of menopause. Now, whilst perhaps there's some challenges with viewing menopause as disabling, it shows that there's really compelling legal reasons and moral reasons for employers to take note. But I think what we're going to be discussing today is that menopause is really that kind of time of life story for, for many women and lots of positives come from that as well. So whilst we may have to face issues surrounding uh, menopause as a taboo, surrounding you know gendered ageism, where women are deemed as either invisible or highly visible and out of place, 
menopause often coincides with quite a promising and positive time of life uh, where women feel that they want to think about leadership in the next 20 years of their career or they feel kind of battle hardened and ready to go and equipped for dealing with demanding role, roles. Um, so really it's about thinking about those mindsets and resources and how organisations can facilitate this. Um, now I know you don't want to really listen to me so I'm going to turn to our absolutely fantastic panel. So unfortunately Christina McKelvey um, who was the MSP for Women and Equalities had to go on sudden medical leave so we wish her a very speedy recovery but in the meantime we have three brilliant women um, leading the call with us today who I'm going to introduce in alphabetical order. The first one is Christina Bar uh, Barf, who is the Executive HR Director here at the University of Glasgow, having held previous positions in retail, water and uh, manufacturing. Um, she's a fellow of the CIPD and she's recently led the development and implementation of the People Strategy for over 10,000 staff employed at the University of Glasgow. So thanks for, thanks for joining us, Christine. The second member of our panel is Jane. Now, Jane English chairs for Women, which is Channel 4's Gender Equality Network, comprised of over 400 members. So whilst our day job includes marketing for shows such as The Great British Bake Off and being a business creative for Channel 4's award-winning in-house creative industry, in 2019, she led the UK media's first ever menopause policy, passionately believing that menopause isn't just a women's issue, it's an issue for anyone, uh, for everyone. Thanks so much for joining us. Jane. Finally, I'm delighted to introduce Sharon Vibert, who is Director of Henpicked Menopause in the Workplace. Now in their fifth year, uh, Henpicked's focus is on supporting employers in becoming menopause friendly following best practice standards. So that could be from introducing policies or guidance documents to educating trainee and training colleagues. And they've worked with a number of UK large organisations and are currently launching a menopause friendly accreditation, which I'm sure we'll, we'll hear about today. So thank you all three of you for joining us and what we're going to do is have a panel for around half an hour before turning to the floor for questions and comments. Now if you're in the audience you can post at any time in the Q&A and you're also free to anonymously share your experiences with the rest of the audience using the Padlet link which is going to be displayed in the chat now. Um, also if you want to join, uh, if you want to look at the live transcript we've got um, a live transcriptionist working with us today and if you wish to see this in a separate window and um, we'll be putting up a link to that uh, to that um, window as well. So um, without further ado I'm going to first of all dive in immediately and I'm going to first of all turn to Jane uh, from Channel 4 and I wanted to ask how did the topic of women work and the menopause come to your attention Jane? So I mean being really honest, up until about two years ago, I knew virtually nothing about menopause. Um, and um, I hadn't really learned about it at school, I hadn't talked to my family about it. Um, and then it was in my position as, as chair of our, our gender equality network that a few people at Channel 4 confided in me and said that they were struggling with menopausal symptoms. Um, and um, they told me about the impact that was having at work. And so I spoke to my co-chairs about that and we decided that as a first step, we were going to email our committee, our four women committee, just to see what they thought about this as, a, as an issue and whether it was something we should, we should look into further. And what was really interesting was our committee was made up of about 11 women. And we sent this email just saying, you know, menopause, what do you think? Um, and we had a bit of a wave of about six or seven emails from this group um, with really personal stories from all of them um, of, of their experience of menopause or perimenopause and what it meant for them at work. And this is quite mind blowing for us because we thought we knew these women, women really well, but none of them had told us these stories. And these stories range from things like, we had one woman, woman who was having uh, about, she said on average about 10 migraines per month. Um, and she was avoiding taking time off because she didn't want to talk to her manager about it. She didn't want to sort of reveal the cause of it. And she didn't know whether she was entitled to sick leave because it was menopause related. We had another who was saying that she was struggling um, uh, with panic attacks in rush hour coming in on the tube, which she'd never experienced before. And it just meant that every day started and ended in a, an incredibly stressful, stressful way for her. And that impacted her performance at work. And so we then thought, right, this is only a, a small group of 11 women, so there must be a bigger issue amongst our water staff population. And we held an open focus group where about 35 women turned up and we had more of the same. And at that point, we knew we had to do something about this. Um, and so we went to speak to our CEO, 
Alex. And what was brilliant about that conversation is she immediately said, yes, absolutely. I, um, you know, I endorse you doing whatever you think needs to happen. Um, and how, how do you need my, you know, what sort of support do you need from me? And so off the back of that, we then developed a policy and um, a lot of activity around that um, to really try and sort of better support women at Channel 4. And, and, you know, part of our aim was also, we realised that there really wasn't much support available outside of Channel 4 in our broader industry. So we wanted to create something that could inspire others to better support women going through menopause. Fantastic. I'm going to I'm going to turn to Christine now because I guess the university is more at the kind of beginning of their uh, their journey surrounding uh, women working menopause. Could you tell me um, kind of when you when you became aware of the the kind of the topic and how it came to your attention? Thanks, Kat. A bit like um, Jane's just described, um, predominantly the, the, the topic came to my attention through word of mouth, speaking to colleagues in my day-to-day -day interactions and, and colleagues across the university more generally. And as you've outlined, Kat, we're at a relatively early stage of our journey in supporting menopause in the workplace. And up until now, um, there hasn't been specific policy provision for menopause in the workplace or uh, uh, the associated symptoms. It's been embedded in our employment policy provisions around flexible working practices and, and home working and, and various other policy that provisions that, that we have in place. That said, um, the university has contributed to a series of menopause roundtables in the recent past with um, a legal firm, Bernice Paul, um, and we were, the purpose of that was to explore how we might best address and support menopause in the workplace, not to mention the significant academic activity that is already existing within, through yourself and ASBS, through ageing and growing older at work within the Adam Smith Business School, but also within our College of Medicine and Veterinary and Life Sciences. And it was really motivated by growing recognition in our part that the majority of women, and until fairly recently, have absorbed their working responsibilities whilst living and working through a time of life when they are experiencing menopause and menopausal symptoms very quietly and largely unsupported, um, regardless of the severity of the symptoms. And, and for many um, in our environment, it's been a hugely private matter. Um, so, I mean, we're not unlike other organisations where 55% of our workforce is female, and of that percentage, um, 25 percent or so a quarter of our workforce are within the 45 to 55 year old age group so clearly likely to be impacted by perimenopause and, and menopause itself and will of course impact all female employees and others at some point in their working lives and an increasingly representative proportion of our workforce so strategically significant for us um, particularly in our values like culture of being an inclusive community and committed to ensuring that our colleagues are as engaged and, and able to have job satisfaction, not to mention issues such as retention and, and you know, attendance. So these are the important facets from my point of view that, that led to um, the level of interest in our immediate work to introduce specific policy provision. Yeah, great. Um, I guess I'd like to turn to, to Sharon now. Um, from your experience of working with a number of, of companies, what do you think are some of the challenges of getting getting people on board and thinking about menopause as a as a workplace issue? And how might we kind of break down these challenges? Yeah, it's a really interesting question and one that we get asked every day of the week. Thanks for inviting me to this panel. It's uh, it's great to join uh, join up with Jane again. Um, so I think the, the biggest challenge really in the workplace is the stigma that's still attached to menopause, that women are seem to be old, moody, sweaty, um, you know, incapable of, of doing their job because of brain fog or they can't, you know, multitask because they're, you know, they, they're unable to remember what those tasks might be. And, and sadly, that is why we, we see it in so many of our sessions that women just don't want to talk about it. They don't want to have that stigma attached. Um, and it's crazy, really, because actually, uh, and it was alluded to earlier, wasn't it? It comes at a time in life where women are extremely capable. You know, they're, they, it, if, if we think that the average age of menopause is 51, um, women are working into their late 60s. Um, and actually one in, I think it's like one in eight of us are, are going to live to 100. You know, that's actually halfway through a woman's life. So we're not old and past it. It actually comes in the middle of our lives. And it's a time when women find that actually 
they have got that um, experience. So they are looking for a much more senior role. They might be managing teams, but also they are multitasking because often it's that sandwich generation where, you know, women are looking after maybe teenagers, still got those teenagers at home. Some even having younger children at home because we're having our babies much later. Um, but also for, for those that are maybe looking after um, the, you know, elderly relatives in that care role as well. Um, so I think the challenges at work come when we think about those negative connotations and those negative stereotypes. So how do we break down that negativity? And it has to be about making it an inclusive conversation. Menopause will affect everyone. It's not a female issue. Um, from an inclusion perspective, everyone will be affected by menopause because Every woman will go through menopause, good, bad or ugly, indifferent, whatever. Every woman will go through menopause. Um, and I, I used to love it in some of our face to face sessions where I would sort of, you know, start with an icebreaker and say, who's here because they're experiencing symptoms? And you get a few very brave people putting their hand up. Who's here supporting others? You get a few more hands. Um, and to get the whole room putting their hand up, I would always say, and who here knows a woman? Um, and, and that is the key here. Um, we're talking about significant hormonal changes that affect individuals. Um, and that is, that is absolutely key because there are reasons why, why others might experience significant hormonal changes and the menopausal type symptoms um, might occur for, for others. And actually, I use the Channel 4 um, panel um, as an example because I remember sitting on that panel talking about symptoms and there was a young man at the back of that room that put his hand up and said, I have got nearly all of those symptoms because I am experiencing significant hormonal changes myself. Um, he had TDS, he was incredibly brave. And I use that example um, when, it, when we talk about inclusion. So I think it is important that we actually include everyone in this conversation. It's great to see so many people um, that, have, uh, that have turned up today as well to, uh, to listen. Fantastic. And I think that's a really inspiring idea of, you know, menopause being not only an interesting um, taboo to break, but also a conduit through which we can create a more inclusive workplace and in general for, for everyone, Sharon. Thanks. Thanks so much for that. Um, now, Jane, what are some of the kind of we, we've already heard the Channel 4 kind of leading the way in this in this area, which is which is fantastic. But what are some of the, the areas are of good practice that you've witnessed um, happening surrounding uh, menopause at work, either in your own organisation? organization or when you were developing your policy elsewhere as well um you know what just before I answer that just to build on what Sharon just said um there was, I don't know if you know the Sharon there was a man um who after the session came to us and said did a similar sort of I'm experiencing all of these but not because he was going through something through something himself but because his wife was and so he said I'm getting sleepless nights and I'm getting you know and again, it plays to your point of, you know, this does affect everyone in a whole myriad of ways. And I think that's what's been so interesting about all of this. And it's actually why we've noticed at Channel 4, there's been a lot of interest in it as a topic. So the panel event that Sharon mentioned was our best attended event of the year. Um, and we had so many younger people there. We had so many men as well as women. It's genuinely a topic that everyone cares about and should care about. Um, and uh, and, and to, your, to your question, Kathleen, I think... Um, in terms of Sean Ford's experience, we, once we had had these focus group sessions and we'd spoken to a lot of women around, around the business about their experiences, we ended up first and foremost introducing a policy. Um, it was really important for us that it was a policy rather than being guidelines because we very much wanted to say, this is our official stance on menopause and how we support it, rather than it feeling like something that was optional that you could look at if you, if you felt like looking at it. And we wrote that policy from scratch. Um, mainly because actually there weren't many good examples that we could find out there. Um, and, and so we put as much of, of what we had learned into that policy. Um, and then we spoke with Sharon and her team to make sure that, you know, from their, in their expert view, that it was covering everything. Um, and the policy itself had two sort of main parts to it. The first is really all about understanding, because as Sharon mentioned, there's this incredible lack of understanding around menopause and around what it is and when it happens and what symptoms are and how that impacts um, people at work. So half of the policy focused on that and, and was focused on sort of busting a lot of myths. 
And then the second half of it was around the practical support that was on offer at the channel. So everything from, you know, the fact that um, women could order desk fans if they needed them, or there was a cool dark space that, that we had created for women if they needed it during the day, um, to how this related to sickness policy and the fact that, you know, these symptoms do count as sickness and you can take time off if you need it. Um, so that was sort of our, our sort of big piece when it came to, came to addressing addressing um, the issues a lot of women were facing. But then around that, we also did a lot of awareness activity because a huge part of solving this for women at work was just saying the word menopause and talking about it and trying to lift that stigma around it so that they had the confidence to raise their hand and talk about it themselves. So we had a big um, panel event launch with, with Sharon and, and a few others. Um, we created some films of our staff members talking about their experience in menopause um, and how it impacted them um, and a few other things. And then we also had a, alongside that other methods of support, like um, some support groups that we set up. Um, so it's a really sort of, we tried to be as holistic as we could based on what we heard people needed. And I would very much say it's, it's, uh, it's very much evolving. So we are still listening and learning and building on what we offer based on on what we hear um, so it's by no by no means job done um, but but it felt like the best start we could have made given given where we started from fantastic mm. um, and I just wanted to to turn to to Christine because we have a, a number of kind of equality diversity and inclusion um, and policies but where do you kind of um, where did you start the conversation as a, I guess, a, an exec, as an HR leader? Where did you kind of start this conversation surrounding menopause um, in the workplace? Uh, it's manifested itself, Kat, and um, uh, across a number of sources. I've, I've already mentioned the link. Um, a number of uh, higher education institutions have, have um, trailblazed in this space already, as, as is known. Um, and we're really keen to embed um, whatever policy provisions we put in place, as you know, um, that's very much in train at this moment in time, but embed them within our health and wellbeing policies, as opposed to as a consequence of other legislative you know, provisions that, that dictate because it's just the right thing to do. And the fact that we want to be very much proactive in this scope, this space, and really picking up the points that Jane and, and um, Sharon have already made around encouraging people not to be embarrassed and not to feel any fear about raising these issues with their line managers or someone with whom they feel comfortable to raise them. And, and I would want to, I mean, I think others have covered the importance of the, the flexibility and, and having the, the, the provisions in place, whether it be a desk-based fan or whatever, but also things like ensuring that they have the capacity to alter their workspace. And if I may say so, in the recent past, it's come to my attention that in these C19 times over the past year, when we've been working in all sorts of different sets of um, um, working environments, predominantly remotely, um, and the capacity to control the, the temperature or, or the ventilation or whatever, but equally it's remotely and people can feel quite socially isolated. And that's really brought into sharp focus for us. Um, so a, a lot of the academic activity has involved not only research like yourself, but also um, focus groups and menopause cafes um, to, to which we've alluded already. And in fact, in one school in our School of Life Sciences, when we are on campus, um, they have a menopause rest space that's distinct from um, anywhere else, any other first aid space, so that anyone in the college can access that space and feel that, that they are supported and acknowledging that everyone's very different um, so that it can be aligned to their needs, whatever that may be. And quite often in our workspaces, and um, now we don't have the same level of control for near conditioned environments. And I have to say, with my people in OD hat on, there have been occasions when I've been very aware of some of the challenges of the temperature issue between the work colleagues, where if we are far more flexible in social workspaces, that makes that, that more meaningful. So um, uh, as you know, we are in the process of actually developing a menopause and hormonal change policy and guidance, but our, our menopause cafe is, are taking off and, and the next one's scheduled for the 26th of March and will be um, monthly thereafter. But I want to pick up too on Sharon's point about talking to men about menopause in the workplace, because one of our PhD students is doing work in that area. And I personally found it enlightening and um, to hear from 
the, the research on question around the fact it's implicit rather than explicit. What can we do to break down these barriers that it becomes a, a productive and positive conversation um, and that there's no fear um, and, and individuals feel confident to break because others can benefit from the experience um, in a way that provides greater flexibility and autonomy. I think that's that's a great point and also and we'll put up the details of the the menopause cafe cafe at the end Christine so thanks for that that shout out I think it's a really interesting question isn't it in terms of um who's affected and and who are, who are the allies here because I think one of the things that I found time and time again is that I'm always really surprised at how little some people know about menopause and I thought that they would and otherwise how much some people know that I just didn't didn't expect I'm, I mean I remember some research we did on a large hospital and someone saying you know well their line manager who was a young man was just the, the the most fantastic advocate and ally in terms of really embedding practice so I guess there's a huge kind of awareness and, and education piece there would, would you would you agree Sharon? Absolutely. I'm nodding ferociously here um, and I totally agree with everything. And I think that's key um, that I, you know, that, that the research that Hannah did um, amongst those um, young members is just fantastic. And I think if we are going to bring about cultural change, because that's ultimately what we want to do here, we want to make menopause an unremarkable conversation that we can just talk about it, whether we're in the coffee queue or just having a chat with somebody, we should be able to just talk about this event. Now, it's, it, is, it is a process in every woman's life. It's not a natural process for everyone. And I think that's what we need to make clear here. And I think you're right. It's important from an awareness perspective that we understand about menopause age. It can happen to anyone at any time in their life. So if you have anyone within your organisation, they are going to potentially be open to significant hormonal changes. And I think that's key. So it does come down to awareness and education and being able to talk about it. And that comes from educating our colleagues. Um, and, you know, in the sessions that we run, we presume that people attending know nothing and we take them on a journey, understanding, you know, what is the menopause, perimenopause, looking at symptoms, you know, psychological versus um, physical symptoms and the effects that they have. We make reference to the Joe Bruce um, research um, because it is really important for us to understand, you know, how does menopause affect us at work? Um, and that is key. Um, and then looking at, you know, how do we manage symptoms? Because that's really important for individuals to know, providing that unbiased signposting, looking at, you know, the holistic approach, the diet, the lifestyle, looking at the medical approach, how to have a great conversation with the GP, how do we have a great conversation at work? Because it's an individual journey and the individual, you know, needs to work in partnership really with their manager. But also I think it's important for workplaces to understand what are the pathways to resource. So what resource is available um, and how do we ensure that that resource is readily available? Um, and it might be that actually, yes, training line managers is one approach and it's a brilliant approach to have, but also what about mental health first aiders? How about training up the mental health first aiders or having some champions or advocates within your organization? And what's been fabulous about um, now having this delivery online is that we can bring cohorts of people together. It, you don't have to all sit in a room. You know, you can bring, if, you, you know, if you've got geographically split people, you can bring them together and talk. And I think, you know, I mentioned it earlier, I think before we went live, that actually what this online, you know, new digital world has enabled us to do is actually to have better access to well-being. Um, for more people to be involved and I know you know my my teenagers know everything there is to know about menopause now the amount of webinars I've run the amount of videos I've played the e-learn you know all the stuff that we do to talk about and it is it's about getting those senior stakeholders on board and I know we had that with you Jane on the panel you know senior women that have been through the menopause talking about their experience and saying I still did my job I might have just needed a little bit of help for a short period of time because it doesn't last forever um, but I think we need to have that empowerment as people to just understand what menopause is, um, how it affects a person, um, and that actually with small changes, they can still be fabulous at work. It might just take a little bit longer and they might just need a little bit of support. And that's, that I think is really important to get that across. We just need to keep talking about it. 
And I think that's such an important point. It's really small changes. I mean, what we found is it's those those minor kind of accommodations that often make a massive difference. I remember speaking to one woman and she said, you know, able to get a fan within a day. And it wasn't the fact, it wasn't just the kind of physical alleviation that the fan gave. It was the fact that she didn't have to fill in five forms, speak to three people, hang on the line for half an hour, you know. And I think so symbolically that told her that she belonged in the organisation. She was welcome and it wasn't it wasn't an issue. And um, how have you found those kind of have you is that what you found in your your situation and your experience, Jane, in Channel Four? Yes, definitely. And I think Sharon made a few really good points. I think something that I've found that, that I might not have expected is that when it comes to raising awareness of menopause and helping people understand it, we've had to do that job for some women who've been through it themselves, because as Sharon says, everyone's experience is different. And I, you know, I spoke to a few women who sort of said, do we need all of this support? Because my menopause was actually relatively easy. It didn't really impact work. And so just educating even people who've been through it, that no, there are 34 plus symptoms and everyone's experience is different, but for one in four women, it's debilitating has has been necessary. So um, that's an observation that I, yeah, I wouldn't necessarily have foreseen, but, um, but it's been a really interesting one. Great. Um, now, it would be remiss of me to not kind of call out the, the theme of the International Women's Day, which is, a, of course, about challenging conversations and about calling out bias and inequality. And I was wondering, given that menopause is perhaps situated in this broader kind of gendered ageism um, sphere where, where older women or mid to, mid to later life women do experience kind of negative perceptions, I was wondering how, how far do you think we are from kind of eradicating that bias and, and inequality um, surrounding older women? more generally. I'll, I'll turn to Christine to Christine first. Thanks Kat. I mean there, there's a number of observations if I may generally in the first instance and it's really to pick up on, on the point you've made about ageing workforce um, aligned with, with obviously your your subject discipline. I mean, and um, for, for for older women, they're, 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 yeah, include myself in that. Um, you know, the, the the health and lifestyle issues when we're actually ordinarily our most productive for the reasons that, that Sharon has, has outlined. Um, highly talented female career pipeline and untapped readership potential um, in terms of personal development, promotion, and, and gender equality more generally. And many of us have, have up to a third of our working life still to go. So uh, real untapped potential and also distinctive and valuable experience to bring in terms of, of the age diverse um, employer perspective, um, as well as the inclusive workplace culture that I would, of course, support. Um, I think I would say in a higher education environment that there are perhaps um, areas, workplaces in which these issues are more prevalent than perhaps the HE by the very nature of the critical engagement that we're used to within a higher education environment. Um, and as you know, with it as part of it as a Russell Group University, we, there is no mandatory retirement age within our line of work. Um, and, and that's significant. And you know, I would say that we've made significant progress in terms of of gender equality, but there's still a lot to be done societally and there's always room for improvement. Um, it, within the University of Glasgow, we've done a lot to eradicate and reduce our gender pay gap and enhance gender equality, particularly at senior levels through career development pathways that are, are very much aligned um, with, with um, the, the career track, particularly for our academic colleagues, but we've got a bit to go in terms of our professional services colleagues to enable them to have the same opportunity. That said, I have to give a recognition to um, the fact that at an organisational level, our senior management group um, is 50% female. Um, and the, the vast majority of that number are above the age of 45. So I would hope that would give um, testament to um, and I don't think I'm giving any, away any trade secrets there, but effectively, um, I think that's, a, a, you know, a, a, we're making progress, of course, as I say, there's a way to go. Sim similarly, our governing body is 40% female and is in fact co-chaired co by Elizabeth Passy, who is co-founder of the 30% Club, and she champions gender diversity at executive levels in, in the boardroom and in, is always advocating to have more women on boards. And we have our first female clerk of Senate and indeed our first female vice chancellor in the last four years. So significant progress, as well as, dare I say it, what I would call emerita professors who have already retired um, and are actually revered and called upon regularly 
um, because of, of their esteem within their subject disciplines. So certainly we have a way to go. We still have 33%. We have 33%. We've achieved a KPI target at our senior level, but we are aiming towards 50%. But that's a long term plan over the next five years. And certainly we will continue to, 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 to work hard to improve um, these, but we will continue to challenge or choose to challenge as the, the, the slogan suggests today. Great, and I'll turn to either Jane or Sharon. I mean, it's, um, it's a big question. How far away are we from kind of eradicating that kind of gendered ageist bias, do you feel? Jane, I'll go to you first. Um, I mean, I think we're still quite far off. I think ageism is a very, very real thing. And I think, you know, from my experience within the workplace, I think women are still very scared to talk about menopause for fear of being labelled old. And that is why they adopt this code of silence in the workplace. And that's why that needs to change. And I suppose I also look at this from a sort of a kind of media uh, perspective. You know, my background is in media and in advertising. And I think media has a huge role in terms of changing, well, firstly, just representing menopause because it's pretty much invisible when you look at the media um, and then authentically representing it as well so that we really get the difference in experience that women have rather than just the kind of common denominator it's a woman at a certain age who gets hot flushes and actually it's quite funny sometimes you know that is what a lot of us have seen in a lot of advertising in a lot of tv shows and, and films so what i would love is to see change in that area because I think as well as you know transformation in workplace policy and, and practices and everything else I think that would make a very real difference. I think that's a great point in terms of just you know in some ways the workplace is just a microcosm of all the other mm. messages that that people get from 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 everywhere else you're, you're absolutely mm. right so um okay I'm, I'm very aware of, uh, of time and we'll be going to the q a shortly so if anyone has any questions they'd like to make or comments please just post them in the q a at the bottom i can see it popping up um, as we speak and um, but before we go to the q a i just wanted to ask him um, if there was one thing that people attending here today um who might be managers or practitioners or, or colleagues and um, should take away um from thinking about women work in the menopause what do you think that should be that kind in one one aspect and I'll turn to Sharon first. I, I think the one thing to take away is to think about what resources you have available. Um, is it is it easy is it easily accessible um, and how confident would your managers be in having a conversation with someone that had put into their diary I'd like to have a chat with you next week about my menopause and how that's affecting me at work. Um, so I, I would I would say education really providing that awareness and talking about it great lovely Sharon I'll go to you next Christine thanks Kat I mean I would echo Sharon's point I think I would be very much promoting taking the lead and encouraging awareness raising and practically supporting positive and productive conversations um, particularly through line managers Fantastic. And uh, Jane, finally to you, last but not least. I think to sort of build on, on what Christine and Sharon said, I, I think for me, it's the fact that um, it makes business sense to support women going through menopause. Um, it's not just, you know, the right thing to do. It's actually for a lot of reasons we've already touched on. You know, we know that women are a growing demographic in the workforce. We know they're working longer. Uh, we know it costs a lot to, to replace them and we also know they're at full tilt in their careers and they're a really valuable asset that we shouldn't be prepared to lose and so um for those reasons and, and many more i think it just there's a there's a great business case for it and from what i've heard that is a really um compelling thought for a lot of businesses and something that businesses don't necessarily think of um and i think i would also also say we talked a bit earlier about the virtual environment and actually in my experience i found that it can actually be a really great way of hearing stories i think people are really prepared to be quite open in virtual environments because they're in the safety of their own home and it, it does bring a bit of a different dynamic and so i would encourage organizations to use that's their advantage and use that as a way of hearing more stories and really learning what um, people in their workforces need and not just on the topic of menopause but on other women's health topics and you know beyond beyond those 
Absolutely. I think there's, you know, there's there's so much um, work to be done surrounding COVID-19 and the impact that has on women working through mm. through menopause, as I think Margaret Rees mentioned in, in our warm up videos. Um, but I'm aware of, of all of the questions uh, coming in and also some of the comments on Padlet. So I'd like to just turn to to some of these. There's some really interesting, um, interesting things come up. The, the first question I'd like to pose is um, menopause like periods is probably often seen as something women just have to manage quietly, as, as Christine uh, mentioned. How do younger women show support for women and their team who are struggling with symptoms? I would like to make sure I can help anyone in this position. It's a really great comment. Um, does anyone like to speak to speak to that, um, that question? Um, I'm, I'm happy to, to help with that. I, I, I think it's about having open conversations, so enabling someone to come and feel confident and comfortable that they can have a chat. And that comes in a few guises, because I often get asked this question in our line manager training. It's how do I go and tell my team um, you know, um, that I've, I've been on this session or how do I tell someone in my team I think they're menopausal? Well, the second one I wouldn't advise um, unless you, <laughs> you know, you're prepared to uh, with the consequences. But I think it's about being open and saying, you know, to everyone in your team, you can put out, you know, a communication to say, I've been on this training or has anybody seen this webinar or, you know, in celebration of and using these events like, you know, um, International Women's Day, um, World Menopause Day, Mental Health, you know, you can use these calendar of events to actually focus on you know the fact that as an organization we are working towards being menopause friendly because that's what we want all organizations to be able to do um, so I think for managers or anyone within a team is to, to keep communicating and saying you know my door's always open if anybody wants to come and have a chat and it, it's the same conversations you would around mental health for example you know it's just communicating that out all the time that you are, you have had some form of training or awareness or you have read about it or that you know it is embedded within your or resources, for example, you know, that it's, it's about keeping that communication going. Um, and, and this is often the challenge that organizations have, and that's where we kind of step in and help with that sort of stuff. Um, but I, I do think that keeping those open conversations embedded um, is, is really key here. Yeah, can I maybe ask, sorry, sorry, Jane. No, you, no, you go, Christine. I was just going to say, could I just add something there to what to, to what Sharon's mentioned? I think we've got a really good platform to move forward from just now, because I think people in the last year have become very aware of individual circumstances and the, the, the environment in which everyone's working. And I think it's fair to say we're, we're being much kinder, we're, we're showing compassion to one another, and we're, we're much more patient than perhaps we are historically. Um, and I hope we, that continues because actually having that space to just be looking out for one another, which I think many of us have been aware of working remotely and, and to, get, to continue to make that happen. But what I've been struck by even in my preparations for today is the intergenerational aspects of this discussion and the fact that young people are coming forward and males are coming forward and saying, being quite open about, like, I really didn't appreciate that. What can I do to help? Um, and it's just making that be, be the norm because then, it, you know, it's in the open and, and it doesn't have the same, um, if you like, fear for, for everyone involved. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, um, colleagues that, that are menopausal or experiencing, experiencing menopausal symptoms will be less slow at coming forward because of that comfort. I, and I was just going to add to that, that, um, you know, don't, I would say don't underestimate your influence because we all have a voice and if we spot someone who's struggling and we think there's something that could best support them that might not already exist we can all go to the person that, that can help with that and say something and try to drive some change there um and i say this because whilst i you know whilst i do co-chair for for women equally i am just a member of staff who've never written a policy before and i was able to do something about it and the people that came to us to talk about it they were just women who were struggling who, who wanted something to change but they didn't know how it should change and you know we've got someone in our team at the moment who came back from maternity leave and she had a rough time um and she went to speak to hr about it and now they're setting up a buddying scheme around returning from from leave so there's always something you can do that does affect some change if there isn't already a support the right support in place um, so, so yeah. 
Fantastic. Um, I'm going to move to the next question. Um, are there inequalities in menopause provision depending on job type? For example, poor provision for those in low paid employment. I think that's a really, a really interesting question. And I think that's perhaps something that, um, you know, speaks to the, the kind of different job demands that, that people have. Um, and also kind of the the sometimes the two tier system we have where you know white collar professional professionals have excellent provision and we actually find hidden in the organization the, there's very poor provision for those that are for example on, on the front line is that something that you you found um you found when you were doing your research Sharon try and think about the whole organization and provision for all women in the organization so for us as a as a business it's really really important to reach everyone um, and whether that's someone that can has access to technology or not, uh, whether it's someone that can jump onto a webinar or someone that's tied to their workspace because they are on a production line. Um, and that's why as an organization, we don't just train people. Uh, we are we work as a supportive partner um, and it's about different types of resources available. Um, and that could be physical in the way of leaflets, which we've um, made provision for many organizations. Um, it could be posters, you know, in uh, in, in um, works in workplaces um, that's accessible to everyone. Um, and you know, looking at uniform um, is really important for organisations. Um, and also to have time away if you are tied in a workspace. You know, if you're work, working on a production line and you've got PPE and you're wearing, you know, several layers and you've got noise and you can't take a break until a certain amount of time, but yet. You know, you're suffering from a urinary incontinence, for example, that then can make your hot flushes worse, makes your anxiety worse. So for us, it's really important that it is embedded across the whole organisation. And we have so many resources that are available as part of our toolkit to enable organisations to do that. We have, you know, HSBC have a brilliant video. You mentioned it earlier, Catherine, um, Christine, beg your pardon, about, you know, um, individuals talking about their experience. I think from the top down, um, everyone has to get involved in that conversation. And for us, you know, we work across, a huge, do a huge amount of work with the NHS. Um, and what we're doing with the NHS is very much embedding advocates and champions. So they are self-sufficient then, so they can raise awareness. Um, so if somebody can't jump onto one of our webinars, for example, because they're working on the front line, they know that there's someone within their, um, you know, uh, team, uh, that could be um, that they could go and have a conversation with and they can then do the signposting and they can say this is available have you thought about that have you spoken to this person here's a great resource pack look on here etc etc um, so that that is absolutely key for every business Fantastic. Um, I've got a, another another question here, and um, it kind of speaks to something we've already we've already brought up about there still being nervousness about revealing any menopause related problems, particularly as it draws attention to age, and sometimes evident perceptions as older as negative or doubtful contributions and and ability and so forth and so um, and so on and so forth. And um, the question is, how would you address this image issue? That were um, that is part of the the taboo of, of menopause. Um, if I go to to Jane, have you kind of got anything to say say in response to that? I'm so sorry, my line cut out in the middle of your question. That's, <laughs> so that's I'm sort of okay. Hoping that someone Did, else's answer would okay, tell me what the question Yeah, was. <laughs> so that, that's fine. These are the the things about online online worlds, basically about, about the kind of it. yes, about the kind of nervousness about revealing menopause because it reveals mm. aspects about age and questions about ability and incompetency, and, mm. and um and how you might address this this kind of image issue that we um that sits alongside menopause. I think. I mean. I. I guess. I think there are a number of things. I think there's the broader social piece and media and how that can help address that. And there's the piece that I, I think we've touched on around using, encouraging women of all levels in the business to speak up. And because I think something that made a real impact at Channel 4 was having some really senior women talk about their experiences of menopause. And so women could look to them and think, okay, it's not necessarily something that's going to hold me back. It's not necessarily something I need to be ashamed of because if she in that top position can have it, then no one should think differently of me and, and, and you know, and doubt my abilities um, to do my job. Um, so I think that's a big part of it, sort of having almost menopause role models that you can um, deploy sort of tactically to, to help with that, that image problem. And I think also just fundamentally, the more people that talk about it, the less of a problem there's going to be when it comes to that. 
Can I just jump in there just to follow on what you're saying, Jane? Because I absolutely mm. agree about that. But also, I think it's about women being empowered themselves as well, um, mm. women educating themselves and reading around the subject. Mm. And we have found what we've done from day one of the pandemic. We've run expert lunch and learns, which are all available on the mm. website under the ex, under men, uh, menopause hub. I can send you the links to those, and they have been so well attended on so many different subjects, from sleep and fatigue to, you know, um, how how to manage symptoms, um, sex, or all, all different aspects. Um, and we've been really encouraged by the amount of people that have been joining those sessions to educate themselves. So I would say. Get the right information from a trusted source, read around the subject, understand, you know, what, what the symptoms are, think about your own personal philosophy for managing symptoms, think about how you might like to manage those symptoms as an individual, and then make a plan. You know, what am I going to do next? Who am I going to talk to? What else am I going to read? And we very much take women on that journey in our colleague sessions. It's called Managing Your Menopause, the three-stage process. Um, and we then give that documentation, not from the individual, obviously, but we use it in the line manager session. So managers have access to that. So they can then say, have you looked at this resource that we have available? Um, so they can really help and support. Um, so I think that that is also really key here is that it is a partnership between the organization and the individual and the two need to come together because you know, this image, I'm a menopausal woman, I don't think I'm old, I'm very capable, you know, I run a household, I, I've managed to get two teenagers out of bed this morning, and hold down a full time job, you know, and I, I, I'm, we need to have these positive role models. And I know they're coming in the media, aren't they, Jane, there's a lot more women, you know, Gabby Logan was the latest one, I know Davina McCall is talking about it, and you know, we have to have this positive image, I'm very much about the positive, you know, I had a negative experience, but I talk about now the positives, now that I've been educated myself, and I have that awareness, and that I think is really, really empowering for individuals. Fantastic. I'm, I'm very aware of time and I'm, I've, I'm aware we've got lots of questions coming in on the chat in various places. And um, so I'm just going to very quickly, I mean, someone mentioned the idea of job share and flexible working to help women recalibrate. And I think, you know, I think that's a, a really important point in terms of how we can use existing structures in place in organisations and say, you know, these are available for all. It's not just for particular um, members or cohorts of the of employees. And there was also another question that came in about um, the kind of intersectional experience of menopause in terms of how it coalesces with sexuality, uh, disability, ethnicity and inter interalia and I think that's a really interesting one because um, from my perspective I guess as a researcher there's been loads of really interesting research from the medical side looking at kind of symptom reporting and symptom experience and that takes that intersectional account in but I think in terms of those kind of broader cultural issues what we know that um, if you um, are, are experiencing menopause and an intersection in terms of uh, sexuality or disability or ethnicity, the legitimacy issue is just ever more important in terms of, you know, trying to keep credibility and legitimacy whilst self-identifying as, as menopausal. Um, so there's absolutely, I mean, you, I think we could spend another hour discussing this, but I'm very aware of, of people's time. So um, what I'm going to do for the meantime is just uh, before we, we close, um, I'm going to uh, going to put up some, uh, a quick slide, if I could ask just Claire and Becky to put up a slide of just some of the resources that we've actually been talking about uh, today. Um, I'd also like to thank everyone who's contributed to the Padlet. It's been it's been fantastic. And of course, to Graham, who's been kind of manically and beautifully uh, visualizing the, the webinar. And uh, what we'll be doing is we'll be sending on um, the, the visual uh, representation and a copy of the recording to all registered participants um, through the Eventbrite. So you'll be getting that within the next couple of days. Um, in the meantime, I'd just like to, um, oh, can we, are we just putting up the screen? Are you able to put up the screen, Claire? My Hopefully. computer has frozen. Okay, no, no, no problem. <laughs> I These, pop, uh, I'll pop the links into the chat just now. 
That's fantastic. So, so what we what I just wanted to let you know is that we have um, some brilliant resources. So, first of all, uh, we have um, Henpecked, which is has a, a kind of wealth, a treasure trove of resources and also webinars. So, we're going to put the link up to Henpick there for those of you that aren't aware of them. And I'm going to thank Sharon so much for uh, for joining us there. And um, we're also going to put up a link to MIPO, which was a um, resource that uh, my team developed a few years ago, which is um, a free open access resource so there's lots of tools there for line managers in terms of starting conversations and um, what to say what not to say and how you might embed it in your existing practices and then we're also um, reminding you that on the 26th of uh, March as Christine mentioned if you're at the University of Glasgow there'll be a menopause cafe event um, that's going to be uh, taking place there and we'll put the the link up for that as well in the meantime I'd like to say thank you so much to Jane uh, to to Christine and to Sharon for joining us and thank you all uh, from the audience and as I said we'll be in touch with uh, those links and the visual and the recording uh, for you to distribute uh, at will um, in the future. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for having us. Thanks, bye now.